Assalamualaikum, everybody. Um, welcome to the return of the Being Muslim series. Um, I want to hand it over to uh, Brother Tabrez in just a moment to introduce our, our next presenter. Um, uh, just um, as a note, um, this there will be a Q&A portion um, towards the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions or comments, um, feel free to drop them uh, in the chat box anytime. Um, or towards the end of the presentation, you can you know use the raise your hand uh, feature of Zoom, and uh, we will call on you if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, but with uh, further without further ado, I'll I'll pass it over to Brother Tabrez to do the introduction. Thanks, Shavia. Assalamualaikum. Hi everyone. Hope you're doing well. I'm Tabrez. I'm going to introduce Abud, who's going to be our speaker today on uh, January 25th for our series. Um, I'll let Abud give a more detailed intro for himself as well, but Abud is an experienced attorney specializing in estate planning and business law. He earned his JD, which is a law degree, at, from UC Berkeley Law and his bachelor's degree from Cornell University. He also has the honor of, he has had the honor of serving as a Fulbright Fellow in Amman, Jordan. I'll turn it over to Abud. Thanks, Abud. Assalamualaikum, everybody. Uh, thank you, Tabriz. Thank you, Shadia, for having me. Um, excited to talk about trusts and wills um, and Islamic inheritance more broadly. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, Shadia, do I have the permissions to do that? You it looks should. like I do. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay, fantastic. So as Tabriz mentioned, I am an attorney. Uh, I generally practice in uh, California, and I specialize in both estate planning and business law. Uh, today, I wanted to uh, give you an introduction about what estate planning is, um, and then an introduction to some of the tools uh, by which we execute estate plans, um, and then some general guidance uh, and, and a general introduction about the Islamic rules on inheritance. So without further ado, let's begin with the question, what is estate planning? So uh, when we think about estate planning, generally what we are planning for is death and incapacity. And when we think about the plan, like what exactly do we do we care about when planning for death and incapacity? Um, it's, it's generally financial matters, uh, such as inheritance. Um, in other words, what happens to my assets? What happens to my stuff uh, after I pass away? And uh, also, we're planning for non-monetary uh, uh, matters as well. So for example, um, if I have minor children, um, and both my spouse and I pass away, um, who will be their guardians um, and who will take care of them uh, until they become adults? Um, another question is family unity. This is this is a big part of estate planning. If Am I going to be setting my family up for success? Um, and, and, and success here is often measured by uh, um, the, the family not fighting over, over matters such as money. Um, or am I setting them up for failure and 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 leaving my estate so vague um, that there will be a lot of fights um, almost certainly? Uh, so those are so those are things that we think about when it comes to the planning process. Um, and last but not least, we think about laws. Um, the U.S., uh, both federal and state, have laws around estate planning. Um, and uh, so does Islam. Um, Allah Azza wa Jal, he, he uh, puts his laws about estate, estate planning directly in the Quran, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. Um, and, and with respect to our tradition, uh, the, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us um, that uh, inheritance and planning um, for uh, inheritance and what happens to you after death is so important um, that it's considered to be half of all knowledge. 
Now, I'm not going to go into the interpretation of this hadith that I have here on screen, but uh, what we can certainly take away from it is that estate planning is very important, uh, not just in our tradition, but for us um, as human beings, as family members, and as, as general members of society. So, uh, who should have an estate plan? Uh, the question to this um, actually comes with more questions. Um, are you married? Do you have a home? Do you have any kids? Do you have a retirement plan? Do you have savings or investments? If you're answering yes to any of these questions, uh, then I would say that you need an estate plan. And the reality is, is, is basically everybody, um, especially here in the United States, uh, is going to answer yes to these questions. Um, and, and therefore, almost everybody in the United States is going to uh, want an estate plan. If you're convinced that you need an estate plan, naturally, the next question is, well, uh, when should I set one up? When should I uh, start becoming serious about having an estate plan? Now, going back to our tradition, we can we can get some guidance here. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that really we shouldn't spend two nights without writing a will um, if, if we have something to bequest, meaning something to pass on to our heirs. So in other words, uh, the answer here is right away. Um, and and that answer is is not so different in a in in a general American concept uh, because the reality is is we can pass at any time, um, and if you're married and you have kids, you and your spouse can pass at any time as well together, um, leaving your 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 children to fend for themselves. So uh, the question of when is the right time to set up an estate plan? Um, the answer in my mind is ASAP. What happens if you don't have an estate plan and you pass? The general answer here is that the government steps in and makes decisions on your behalf. Um, and, it, and, and it's really for that reason um, that it, it, it behooves you and it behooves your, your family to have something in writing um, so that the government uh, doesn't speak on your behalf. So uh, if, uh, if, for example, you have uh, something to leave to your heirs, uh, the the state uh, usually um, it's uh, the, these rules are uh, differ from state to state, but the state will have some default rules um, in which they'll stipulate uh, a priority schedule of of heirs um, and and how much um, each heir is going to be inheriting from your assets. So that's the financial end of it. When it comes to your children, if you haven't nominated guardians, um, the state will come in, will step in and assist in the selection of your guardians. Again, another area where we don't really want the government stepping in. We would rather stipulate who our heirs are, um, how much each heir is going to inherit from us, and who guardians are for our families, for our, excuse me, for our children. Can we ask a question in between or should we wait till the end? I would say let's wait until the end um, and then we can we can just do a general Q&A if you don't mind. Thank you. You're welcome. So if you're convinced that you want an estate plan and you want to set one up, uh, what are the tools that you're going to use to set up a plan? Uh, when it comes to planning for death, there are two uh, main tools to think about. Uh, one is a, is called a will, which uh, I'm sure everyone has heard of. And then the other one is called the trust, which most of you have heard of. Uh, uh, and if it, and and even if you have heard of it, maybe you're wondering what is a trust and how does that differ from a will? And we're going to be uh, we're going to be discussing that in detail in the upcoming slides. In terms of incapacity, um, and and when we say incapacity, we are talking about a situation where you are still alive, but incapacitated, uh, meaning uh, you, you might be unconscious or you might be in a coma and you're unable to handle your, your affairs. For that, uh, we're going to want to think about putting a power of attorney and a healthcare directive in place so that you're, you're prepared and your family's prepared for that scenario. So let's start with a will. What is a will? A will is basically a document uh, that stipulates who gets what, how much do they get, and when and under what circumstances. Um, so a will is basically a document that takes effect after your death. So it, 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 it does not 
uh, have an impact on your life while you're alive. Um, but it does have an impact in it and it kind of springs into action upon your death. Um, it is in the will where you can nominate guardians for your minor children. Um, and the one of the defining features uh, and defining reality of a will, sorry, not a feature, but a reality, um, is that it is uh, going to require something called probate. And what probate is, is a court supervised distribution of your assets. In other words, if your heirs, your beneficiaries are receiving anything, uh, are receiving assets from you, let's say, for example, a home, real property or real estate, um, your estate is going to have to be probated before they can take custody of that asset. In other words, uh, they have to wait for a judge to uh, rubber stamp their custody of that real estate. And that leads me into some negatives as to uh, why we, we worry about probate. Number one, uh, it takes a long time. In California, for example, it takes nine to 12 months on average to go through probate. Um, there's also another issue with going through probate, which is, uh, which is privacy. Um, you lose a, a privacy for your estate. And what I mean by that is because probate is a court proceeding, um, the will and relevant documents are all going to be filed um, and are going to be publicly accessible. Uh, if you see this picture on my screen, this is a picture of the website of the Superior Court of, of uh, California, Los Angeles. Um, and here you can see where I've circled is where you would click to, to start searching for probate documents of whoever you want. Third uh, thing we worry about is cost. Probate is costly. So uh, what I have here on screen, uh, you can see a fee schedule for fees that an attorney will collect by probating uh, your estate. Um, and then uh, sometimes a court will award fees to an executor, and those uh, are actually um, uh, they're, they're actually written into code uh, directly into the statute from state to state. And then lastly, you're going to have some fees, for example, court filing fees, bond fees, if relevant, appraisal fees, and miscellaneous fees. So to give you an example of what probate might cost your heirs, um, if we imagine an estate that's worth about $1.5 million, um, you're looking at about $28,000 in attorney's fees, potentially $28,000 in executor fees. Um, and then uh, let's just say a few extra thousand for additional fees and you're and, and totaling uh, 60,000 just to go through probate. Now, I'm not going to leave you hanging with all those problems because the answer to that is going to be the trust as an alternative to a will. Um, and basically what a trust is, is it's a, it's a, it's an arrangement and it, through a writing um, that's going to help you manage assets while you're alive and after your death. And there are two general categories of trusts. One is called irrevocable and the other is called revocable. But uh, generally speaking, there are many flavors and many recipes of trusts, all of which have different use cases. Today, I'm only going to talk about the revocable living trust, uh, which, which is what we normally work with when we're optimizing for inheritance. So some of the features of a trust are number one and most important is the avoidance of probate. The costs that I mentioned earlier, the privacy issues that I mentioned earlier, and the time issues that I mentioned earlier all go away if you had a trust in place before you pass. Um, second feature is that it's revocable, meaning you can revoke it at any time you want. You're in control. You, you can put assets in. You can take assets out. Um, it's, a, it's a nimble document, um, and it's super flexible. Uh, third is the uh, selection of trustees, which basically allow uh, for the management of the assets after your passing. So a will, generally speaking, is going to be a one and done type of instrument where uh, assets are most likely going to be liquidated after death and distributed accordingly. Um, with a trust, Assets can live on and man be managed and, and have some continuity after your passing. Um, and, and that can be valuable in many circumstances. Um, second, uh, sorry, fourth 
is uh, privacy. As mentioned earlier, uh, in a will, you lose privacy, but with a trust, you maintain privacy because the trust document is never filed anywhere, not during your life and not after your death. So just a quick summary uh, between a will and a trust. Um, a, tr a will is, is, is a document by which you can, you can, uh, you can have your, your beneficiaries inherit assets from you, uh, but it's going to go through probate. Um, it is generally more on the simple side um, uh, from from a doc from a drafting standpoint, which means that it's a cheaper document to draft. In fact, um, there are many free will drafting tools that you can use as a self help mechanism. Um, uh, it's not private, uh, meaning your your estate uh, and the documents therein are going to be publicly accessible after you pass if if your heirs go through probate. Um, and generally speaking, it's it's a more static document. Um, the living trust, uh, on the other hand, avoids probate. Um, it can be either, either simple or complex, uh, depending on your needs. Um, it maintains privacy, and it's more dynamic. Um, you can set up many more conditional statements. And when we when we when we th think about Islamic inheritance, um, it aids a little bit more with that. But it's not it's not you don't need a trust. To have a a a proper est, uh, Islamic estate plan in place, you can still use a will. A trust is just going to be a little bit more dynamic. So, will and trust are death planning documents. Now, let me talk to you about the incapacity uh, planning documents. The first is a power of attorney, and this document allows you to select an agent that's going to have the power to manage your assets and to manage your legal affairs on your behalf while you're incapacitated. So it's a very powerful document. Um, and then the healthcare directive is going to give an agent that you select the power to make healthcare decisions on your behalf when you're incapacitated. So for example, let's say that you need an, an operation, um, you're unable to authorize that operation to your doctor because you're in a coma, uh, your agent can step in and say, yes, doctor, let's proceed with the operation. So um, that's a general uh, trust and wills 101. Um, we talked about what estate planning is more broadly. We talked about some of the tools uh, that we use uh, to effectuate an estate plan. Um, and in this last section, I want to talk to you about um, Islamic inheritance. How do we think about um, inheritance and estate planning in our tradition? And the the interesting thing about Islam is, is uh, inheritance is actually quite prescriptive. Um, unlike uh, what you see in the media, on TV, in the movies, when it comes to estate planning uh, and popular culture, where uh, people can basically say or do whatever they want, um, in is in the Islamic inheritance uh, uh, kind of uh, kind of view um basically we rely on Allah Azza wa to tell us exactly what to do um and Allah tells us what to do uh, and prescribes uh, the inheritance schedule directly in the Quran predominantly in surah an-nisa um uh, but there are verses in other other surahs um, and and in these in these surahs, he tells us exactly who our heirs should be, and what the distri distribution schedule should be to those heirs. Generally speaking, um, when we think about a priority schedule of inheritance distribution, funeral expenses and debts are paid first, um, followed by any wasiyah that you might leave, and this is what's called a discretionary bequest. So we have uh, an allotment of up to a third of our estate that can go towards this wasiyah. Um, and then and then if we choose to leave a wasiyah, only thereafter um, will the fara'id be calculated um, and distributed. And uh, one, important to, uh, one important thing to note about Islamic inheritance in general is that it applies to your, if you, and this, we think about this specifically when we're married, is that it applies to your wealth only, not your sp spouse's wealth, which basically means each spouse is judged accordingly um, and is governed accordingly. So... Uh, I want to address the wasiya a little bit because this is one of my favorite parts of the uh, Islamic estate planning journey. 
Um, this one third uh, allocation, which which you can pick at your discretion, um, uh, has specific categories that can it, of beneficiaries that it can go to. It can go to charities. Um, it can go to relatives. Uh, or people, generally speaking, that are not entitled to inheritance under the fara'id. Um, and it can also go to an ex-spouse, for example. There are other categories. I'm not going through all of them right now, but these are. This is. Uh, th I just wanted to kind of mention a few, just so you have an idea of where the wasiya can go. Um, but uh, my favorite is this aspect of leaving a wasiya to charity, uh, because to me, it's a low-hanging fruit when it comes to sadaka jariya. Um, you've passed away. You don't need the money anymore. You're not taking it with you to the akhirah. This is your your opportunity um, to really plan for something that's going to work for you in your akhirah and work for you and 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 maintain a legacy for you um, after your passing. Uh, on screen here, I have a picture of a well that is called the Well of Ruma, and this to me. Uh, is a very interesting well because um, it was purchased by uh, one of the Sahabis and Khalifas, Uthman ibn Affan, and radiallahu anhu. And basically, um, the, the the man who owned it before him used to charge a premium for water in the area. Uh, and Uthman ibn Affan tried multiple times to buy it, and finally one day. Um, uh, the the seller agreed to sell it to him, and he immediately made the water free uh, for the ummah and free for uh, those in need in the area. And the beautiful thing about this well is that it survived until today, and it's still generating water until today, and still satiating the thirst of people um, in 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 Mecca today. Um, after all of these years, I mean, imagine, imagine what kind of thawab, what kind of legacy this is uh, for uh, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. And it, and and I say all this to say is like, look, this, this technically could be, uh, uh, theoretically could be any one of us who leaves money to buy something and 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 let it serve uh, those in need uh, for many years to come. And and the wasiya is an opportunity to set that up. And by the way. Um, uh, uh, to me, what how you know what I always advise my clients is just like you're putting in all this effort to think about your family. Um, I always advise people to put in the effort to think about and design um, exactly how uh, they are going to leave that sadaqa jariya, how it's going to be executed, where it's going to be, what kind of uh, benefit it's going to provide to society, um, and inshallah, um, it'll benefit you uh, for many years to come. Okay, next is the fara'id. Um, so this is this is the last category to be distributed. And um, the heirs in most circumstances, not all, uh, but most circumstances, um, are going to include parents, a surviving spouse, and children. And uh, should there be parents around, each one of them will receive one-sixth of your general estate. Uh, should you have a surviving spouse, that spouse will will uh, will will be, uh, will receive about one third or one eighth, just depending on who the spouse is. Um, and then, lastly, the children will will inherit the rest in a ratio of two to one, uh, sons to daughters. One thing to understand about Islamic inheritance is that the heirs and the fractions uh, are determined by who is actually alive at the time of death. Um, and that's why I said earlier that the heirs in most circumstances and not all circumstances are these three categories uh, because, because siblings may come into the picture at some point in time, for example. You may only have one parent and not the other around. You may not have a spouse around and you, you may only have daughters and no sons. So these fractions and who's inheriting all shift um, uh, based on who is alive at the time of your passing. Now, just for fun, I, I wanted to uh, uh, put up an ayah uh, from Surah An-Nisa. This is verse number 11. And I wanted to walk you through um, how uh, Allah communicates to us exactly how he wants us uh, to design our estate plans. And um, let's, let's, let's start with, let's, I, have, I, I prepared two ayahs, but in, in the interest of time, I'm only going to go through one. Um, so let's start with this. Uh, 
uh, fi awladikum. So Allah here is, is, is telling us that uh, with res that He's commanding us with respect to our children that unthayain, to your sons, your sons will inherit twice the daughters. However, if there are two or more girls, but no sons, they will split two-thirds equally. Or if there is only one daughter, she receives a half. And, and when, we, when we're talking about fractions here, we're talking about uh, uh, these fractions apply to your estate and specifically your estate as the wife or your estate as the husband, so as the mom or the dad. Um, and, and for your parents, so you as the wife or the husband, for your parents, each a sixth, if you're leaving children, meaning if you, if you have children uh, when you pass, فَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ وَلَدٌ وَوَرِثَهُ أَبَوَاهُ فَلِأُمِّهِ الثُّلُثِ However, if there are no children, the mother will receive one-third. فَإِن كَانَ لَهُ إِخْوَةٌ فَلِأُمِّهِ السُّدُسِ Unless there are siblings, in which case she will receive one-sixth. مِنْ بَعْدِ وَصِيَّةٍ يُوصِي بِهَا أَوْدَيْنِ And Allah is telling us here that this is paid out after the wasiya, which we discussed earlier, is paid out. Uh, and after your debts are paid out. Um, and this is very interesting what Allah is telling us here. And he's basically telling us that between your parents and between your children, you do not know who is, 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 is of benefit to you more. Uh, that, you know, that, that was a little bit of a mouthful to say, but basically what Allah is trying to communicate to us here is, is that if we're thinking, hey, why, why are my parents receiving uh, 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 an inheritance when my children are still young? They have their whole lives ahead of them. Shouldn't they just inherit the whole thing? Uh, and, and, and what Allah is telling us here is, look, if you have these questions, just remember that you don't exactly know what's going to be better for whom and what's going to be better for you because there are arguments that can cut both ways um, and in multiple ways. And Allah then tells us that this faridatan min Allah, this is an this is this is a requirement and obligation from Allah. Inna Allah kana aliman hakima that God is the all knowing, the all wise. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to just uh, walk you through this so you can see how it reads. It, 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 it you know if you are a lawyer. Um, and I and 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 you know, discuss this with my estate planning colleagues all the time. Is that if you were a lawyer, this this really reads like a law. Um, it reads like a statute. Um, and 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 from a from an Islamic law perspective, uh, the law of inheritance is the most clear and robust when compared to other obligations that Allah uh, bestows upon us in the Quran. So it's 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 very interesting from a legal perspective. So um, I don't want to just leave you with uh, all that, you know, legal jargon and all those concepts without giving you uh, an, an, an example. So let's take uh, brother Muhib here, um, who is married to sister Aisha. And let's assume that sister Aisha passes away first. And let's assume that after we've paid her debts and after we've paid out any wasiya that she decided to leave, um, she has $100,000 left that are going to go to the faraid. So how is this distributed? Um, uh, alhamdulillah, her parents are still alive. So mom and dad are still around. Each one of them will get a sixth. So about $16,500. Um, her husband is still here. He's, he's, a, he's a surviving spouse. He's going to receive one-fourth, which is about $25,000. And then uh, she's leaving... Two children, uh, a son and a daughter, and her son will receive twice what her daughter will receive. Um, so he'll receive uh, about twenty-seven and a half thousand, and then uh, her daughter will, will receive almost fourteen thousand dollars. Now, if you're wondering, well, this is all nice and it's great, 
And I, you know, I like the idea of being organized and I like the idea of putting everything in writing. And I like the idea of following the Islamic rules of inheritance. Um, but you know what? I, you know, I trust my spouse. I trust that they're going to do the right thing and that they'll take care of it. Now, let me tell you why that's not necessarily a good idea. Because even if Brother Muhib here was a well-intentioned Muslim brother um, who wants to abide by, by uh, God's law um, and wants to do the right thing, he may not necessarily be aware of what the rules are, right? And there, there is a legitimate chance that uh, that under state law, basically, he's going to inherit 100% of that $100,000 that Aisha is leaving behind. Now, why is that a bad thing? Um, well, first off, from, a, from an Islamic perspective, uh, Aisha's parents have a right to one-sixth each, right? That is their God-given right. And if, if uh, Muhib unknowingly takes 100% of the $100,000, then basically uh, the mom and dad aren't getting anything. Um, so their rights are breached in this example. And uh, although his children are still young, um, technically that's still their money and he should be holding it on their behalf. And if that's not accounted for properly, uh, life may go on and he may spend that entire 100,000 and uh, son and daughter um, won't have anything in their older ages. Let me give you another example of why this might not be this might not be a good idea to just leave it to your spouse to figure it out um, if if you were to pass away. Um, let's just say life happens. I mean, Brother Muhib is young. Uh, again, he's well intentioned. He's not trying to take anything from anybody, um, but but he's young and 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 he decides to get remarried. No problem with that. Uh, however, if he didn't account for Aisha's uh, bequest of a hundred thousand dollars properly, um, he's gonna find himself in a in a situation where again, mom uh, Aisha's mom and dad are not gonna get anything, except this time, uh, his new wife is actually gonna inherit from Aisha directly, um, and that is not gonna be a good outcome, uh, 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 especially since mom and dad aren't going to be getting anything anyways. By the way, I want to be specific here. We're not talking about um, Muhib's new wife not getting anything from him because remember the inheritance is based on each spouse differently and here we're talking about a situation where Aisha has passed and she's leaving a bequest when he passes he'll leave a bequest and he'll leave uh, a bequest to his new wife but the new wife technically speaking should not be getting a bequest from Aisha I just want to I just want to clear that up um, the other issue is let's say uh, brother Muhib has children with his new wife, those children are go are going to be inheriting as well from him when he passes. And if he hasn't accounted for Aisha's one hundred thousand, his new children, who are not Aisha's children, are going to be inheriting from her wealth as well. So this is just a real life example of what could happen if 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 an, a proper estate plan is not set up from the get go. And uh, when we think, you know, just, and this is more of a summary slide, but when we think, generally speaking, about principles for a Sharia adherent estate plan here in America, kind of combining the initial part of our conversation and linking it to this latter part of the conversation, um, basically what, what we want is we want an estate plan that's in writing, that's enforceable under U.S. law, um, and we also want a, a plan that incorporates a dynamic Islamic distribution schedule, because remember, the beneficiaries change based on who's alive after your passing. And then lastly, is one that's differentiating between the husband's wealth and the wife's wealth. As long as those three things are in place, you should be in good shape, inshallah, to, uh, to achieve your goals. And then a big bonus here, which is not the subject or scope of, of this presentation here, is to be tax efficient. And there are many considerations to think about when being tax efficient, but it's just a note here um, to, to kind of shelf 
in 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 memory here as as you think about the future and 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 what type what, what if any estate planning that you want to do in the future inshallah um, and that concludes my presentation here's my contact information um, if anybody wants to chat if you want a free consultation i'm happy to provide that uh, feel free to jot down my email um, and my phone number here and thank you very much everybody jazakallah khair i'm happy to uh, accept any um, questions and answers here. And by the way, uh, this is something I should have mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, um, is that none of this here should be construed as legal advice. Um, legal advice really can only be given to your situation, which I'm happy to do um, uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, and secondly, is that I'm not a sheikh. Um, I'm speaking strictly from a legal perspective here. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, if, if my reading of the verses is, is, is incorrect, please forgive me. Uh, but generally speaking, um, I am not a sheikh, so I, I, you know, I don't, I don't give, uh, uh, um, is, you know, Islamic, uh, uh, Sharia advice, um, on, on, on this call or otherwise. Thank you very much. Abu Zakala, thank you for that presentation. That was, uh, incredibly, incredibly uh, informative. And, um, you know, I, I personally have done a will and yet I've learned so much and I think I need to go back and just double check my will and make sure that, that everything is, uh, is lined up, but we do have a, uh, a couple of questions. So the first one that came in was regarding guardians, guardians for your children, should you and, and your spouse pass, um, is it possible if you're living in the States, could you designate um, say relatives who live outside of the U S as your children's guardians. Generally speaking, it's not advisable. Um, you're going to want to th think a lot of times the, the answer to these questions, um, uh, uh, like the best answer is one where you're putting yourself in that situation directly. Right. So imagine, imagine that you've passed and your spouse have passed and you have, have kids right? 10 years, 10 year old kids. Um, and your guardian who, who you've, who you've selected is living outside in Dubai, in Syria, Palestine, wherever. Um, what happens in that scenario? Okay. They need to be informed. Well, what if it takes time for them to be informed? Uh, and even if they are informed, how long is it going to take to get a flight, travel all the way over here, go through a court proceeding? So it's, 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 that all leads to one, uh, one uh, trying to plan for these worst case scenarios, um, which is to basically say it's better to have someone um, that's local, um, at least in the United States, right? At least in the United States, but ideally local um, and, 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 and in the area. Um, can we expand on that just a little bit? I mean, are there, and again, I, I, my apologies if this is outside of your realm of expertise, but you know, is this to say that you could have have a conversation with the people that you've named as guardians and say, I've named you as a guardian, you're a U.S. citizen, we have family in, say, India, and we really want our children to have that connection to that family. You know, can you, um, you know, take part of their inheritance and use it to send them to visit family for extended periods of time or anything? And can you include stipulations like that? Yeah. So, so I don't want to miss... I, I don't want anyone to misconstrue my last statement as saying like the only thing you can do is you have to have someone in the in the city that in 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 which in which uh, your children are, but um but the more complexity you know you you put into this sort of thing, um the more uh um uh complexity you're actually going to create when it matters most right. So one naming a a guardian that you trust is not to say that um the, you know you you arrangements can't be made otherwise after your passing. What I worry about is just being able to take custody of the children as quickly as possible um, and as soon as possible after passing. Uh, what you mentioned, though, about communicating with with folks um, about what you, you know, how, how you want, you, you know, what you want to happen to your children and with your children after passing. One of the biggest um, uh, let's call it parts of the estate planning journey is actually starting that thought process and those conversations, right? No matter what documents you have in place, uh, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't um, basically, it, it, it doesn't 
equate to setting your family up for success, right? So even if you pick a guardian um, that's here in the United States, but you really want um, someone who's international to care for your children, um, then it's just, it, you know, it's definitely uh, having a conversation with both parties and getting everyone on board in terms of, uh, of what, what your wishes are is important. It's equally as important as putting the documents in place. For sure, for sure. And, and again, this is a yeah. great reminder, right? It's not just, get, like, like to your point, not just getting these things down on paper, but really having these conversations with those around you who, you know, if something were to happen to you, what, what happens next? Um, and exactly. so thank you for opening up, you know, that avenue for folks to have those conversations, to start thinking about these things. Um, so another, another question here, what is the best way to find a lawyer locally um, to help write a will or create a trust, keeping the Islamic law in mind? You know, what do we, what does one look for um, or ask that person when you're seeking out legal advice or legal representation? Yes. So it, in my opinion, it's best to work with an attorney um, who focuses on estate planning or is at least a significant part of their practice. And the other is, is, is to work with one that is familiar with the Islamic rules of inheritance um, and, is, and is equipped to um, embed that into and integrate it with U.S. law. Um, so that's, that, that's what I would look for when looking for counsel. Um, again, feel free to contact me. Uh, I typically will work with local counsel if I'm doing something out of state, but happy to be help or answer questions. Otherwise, um, if, if someone ends up working with an estate planning attorney, that's not familiar with the Islamic rules of health inheritance, you can find someone to consult on it. Right. And, and, and help that attorney get it right. Fantastic. And thank you. Thank you for offering, um, you know, your, your aid and assistance, uh, in addition to, to whoever, you know, wherever we are locally, who we, who we find. Um, another question is how much do you charge for a full trust planning? I don't know if that's specifically to you or just maybe a ballpark figure. What, what do folks, you know, what should we expect if we're looking to set up a trust for the family? Yeah. Ballpark figure is, is a few thousand dollars. So the, the, the trust is certainly more expensive than a will. As I mentioned earlier, you can find free will tools online. Um, in fact, uh, one of my uh, uh, colleagues and, and close friends of mine built a free one for the Muslim community. Uh, and, and that one can be found at www.muslim.estate. Um, so that's a free will tool. But, uh, but setting up a, a, a trust is, is, a, is, is it requires work and, and, and it's, a, it's a little bit more expensive. But not as expensive, you know, dealing as probate. with the, Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So it's a lot, lot less expensive than probate. And um, like I said, the, the beauty of the trust is, is that you have continuity uh, for your family from day one, whereas with a will, you're going to have a fragmentation um, because, because of the court uh, process. Absolutely. Um, and, and this next question, and again, you know, you stated you're not a sheikh. Uh, and I don't know if we have any, you know, uh, uh, Islamic jurist in the group here, but can you, is there, is there, can you offer any insight or can you expand on the reasoning? Uh, again, this would be Allah's reasoning, right? Of why is it prescribed that um, the sons receive more than daughters? I imagine you would have received this question a number of times. And if you can shed any light on that from an Islamic perspective, if not, totally understand. Sure. Yeah, I can offer I can offer two uh, concepts or ideas to think about when when trying to understand that. I know and I realize that um, it's it's challenging, especially for for us having uh, lived here in, in in the West and 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 having having uh, um, you know having all these ideas of what fairness is. Um, it, it's a challenging concept to 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 kind of understand and accept for many people, and I accept that. Um, here's two things to think about. Number one is uh, Islam is 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 a whole package, right? It's not a it's not a piecemeal idea. Um, so what does that mean? Islamically speaking, um, there are other rules uh, placed upon males, other rules placed upon females. So technically speaking, and even historically speaking, um, males were responsible for 
uh, financially supporting uh, uh, their their mothers, their sisters, their their wives, um, and uh, historically speaking, they can actually be taken to court for not for failing to do so. Right. So so th this was a right that um, that was uh, um, 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 you know given to uh, women on on men in their lives. Um, so that's that's one thing. Now you might say, well, okay, fine. That was historically now. Um, you know, uh, more women are going to college than men. And, and, you know, m you know, why, you know, why do we need to think that women are dependent upon men? Um, this is where I'll offer my the second idea to think about, which is our idea of fairness is always going to be, uh, uh, challenged by different situations, right? So like what I just mentioned as historic, like that was seen as fair at the time. In fact, it was seen as a great deal. Now it's not. Who's to say that we don't? You don't go to another country where it still is seen as fair, right? There are certain countries in the world right now um, where uh, you, you know, like like we'll talk about Syria for example. Um, right now, in, in, in Syria, experienced one of the largest uh, refugee crises in in in, in history. Um, and, and, you know, if you, if you go to the country and you talk to people there, they'll tell you, Hey, there's a lot more women than men. And, and, you know, there's, there's an issue there. There's an issue, right? So, so we're living here and we're thinking that everyone lives like us, but that's not exactly the case. Um, the, the, the second idea here is, is in Allah told us this in the verse is that we don't know what's, you know, what's, what's fair for us. And, and the way I'm going to explain that and the way I think about that is, um, ha is, is from my experience, uh, setting up estate plans uh, for clients that do not subscribe to the Muslim faith. Um, and in, in these situations, um, like, and I've seen it, you'll have someone who is wealthy and they'll give everything to charity, some to a pet and nothing to their children, zero. And when you talk to that child, they are so heartbroken, despite them not having had a good relationship with 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 with, with their mom. That they're so heartbroken, and you can tell, like, just as a human, like you've lost, like that person is feels betrayed. They feel like th there's a right that they can't articulate, and it's just been breached. Right? It's like, how can that happen? I mean, you know, and 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 even when it comes to parents, like in our tradition, we give to our parents. In, in a lot of these cases, no one's given anything to their parents, right? So, and again, I bring up the question is, who's to say what's fair? Um, so, so the only way to, or sorry, not the only way, but one way to get on the journey of kind of accepting it how it is and really truly being like, okay, this is Allah's rules and I trust what it is, is to think about the best alternative. The best alternative is what? Is everyone, it's chaos. Everyone's doing what they want and a lot of those situations aren't fair themselves. So that, that, that's that's kind of how I think about it. You know, subhanAllah, there's so much wisdom that um, is often missed if you just read the surface level, you know, interpretations or translations. Um, but there, you know, what Allah was was giving to the community was so revolutionary. And I think you're right, looking back, you know, from 1400 years in the future, it's hard sometimes to see just how revolutionary um, those verses were to those people. And so I think we have to keep that in mind. Um, and maybe another another question to follow up, um, it, you know, if in the future when you pass away um, and you have family members inheriting your money who may not be good with money or may misuse the funds uh, for, you know, maybe they've got vices that are haram or sinful, can you keep them out of the will or does that go against Islamic rule? So broadly speaking, generally speaking, and if you notice, you I always use the word, word general and broad here because there's so many permutations of everything. Um, and also also some things just require research. Um, uh, the, the answer to that is um, the principle is, is that this wealth is their wealth, right? In other words, it's prescriptive. And, and, and when you think about it, it's prescriptive it, and, and you think about it in terms of rights. So your son or daughter who's not good with money, um, this, this inheritance is, is their right. So then the question is, okay, like, but you want to help them. Well, how do you help them not make the right decision? Um, this is, this is where things are a little bit more, more, they air more on the Islamically air more on the line of it's, it's up to them. 
right? Now, uh, uh, I want to err on that. I'm not a sheikh, so this requires a lot more conversation with a lot of sheikh and jurists. But if read by the letter of the law, the letter of the law would is a little bit more black and white on this, is you can't control it. The one thing you can control is this issue of maturity, which means you can hold the inheritance um, until uh, that, that son or daughter is mature. Um, and, and we often have that conversation. Uh, I have that conversation with my clients and, and we'll set it at an age. Maybe it's 20, 21, 22. And it differs, but you know your kids, right? You know, uh, 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 generally speaking, if they're m mature for their age, if they're you know not so mature for their age, and you can kind of work with that number as you, as you please, but you just can't hold it for, for, for too long. Um, the one area where you, you just can't, you know, you, you can withhold completely inheritance, meaning basically disinherit um, a child is, is only if, if they have basically left the deen, right? If they've left, left Islam. Um, and in that case, they, they exit the category of fara'id and, and uh, they, they enter a category within the wasiyah. So you can give them some of the discretionary, but they're no longer a fara'id uh, beneficiary. Um, and, and, and that, that's not like, um, are they Muslim? Are they not? No, this is like where someone is just, you know, announcing, you know, with witnesses and that sort of thing. I'm not, I'm no longer, I'm no longer Muslim. Got it. Got it. Um, I want to call on Hamid here. Who's got a question. So Hamid, feel free to unmute and ask away. All right. So I have three questions. Um, the first one is, uh, is this confirmation based on what you're recommending is that do not do well, do a trust. So you can avoid the probate, uh, avoid all that, correct? Okay. Yes. Broadly speaking and generally speaking, and really, really, uh, this conversation can get a little bit more nuanced, but I'll give mm -hmm. you one more general point that you can, you can think about is if you own real estate, you're generally going to want uh, a, a trust. If you don't own real estate, um, you could get away with a will and still avoid probate to some degree. Um, it just depends on what are the assets that you're holding. Um, so it's like it, it, the, the analysis on that is done on an asset by asset basis, if that makes sense. Like, for example, for example, um, a 401k, you can list the beneficiaries uh, a, 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 as a payable on death designation within the account itself, within the brokerage. Um, so technically you can get away with a will and not go through probate, but then you enter other issues, which is, is you know, it's not the most uh, efficient and, and elegant of ways to pass assets onto, onto your beneficiaries. So, uh, but broadly speaking, to answer your question, yes, trusts are going to be superior. Thank you. Our second question is that, um, at least in Texas, um, you know, of course, when you get a house, right, you typically have it, you know, it's on, you know, by both, you know, husband and wife. So this, the example that you gave of Aisha and Maud, um, is that 100000 Is that typically um, only uh, the trust and stuff for for money in the bank? Or like it's like if the one spouse passes what ha and the other spouse is alive and the house is, you know, assume 500000 and how does that... You know, does the house have to be sold so the husband's parents can get a sixth? Or how does that work? So um, we can discuss that on a on a one to one basis. There's multi usually when we're talking. So when I set up a plan with a client, you know, one of one of the 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 first meetings we'll have is something called a design meeting, um, and we go through the different scenarios and we in in and, and we kind of talk about it and we make certain decisions. Um, and different people do it different ways. Uh, um, and I, your voice was a little bit muffled, so I couldn't hear the, the, the first part of your question. So I, 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 did I answer all of it or did I miss, uh, an embedded question within your question? Um, so in Texas, the house is, you know, typically if somebody gets a house owned by husband and wife, they're both on the deed. And so if the husband passes away, um, does the, the wife have to sell it to give the sixth? Uh, uh, a sixth uh, piece to the father and mother of the husband, or um, or does the house still stay with the with the spouse? Yeah, the assets are not. They're you're not. When we talk about these fractions, they're they're on the total estate, um, and they're not on an asset by asset basis. So uh, cash, 
can be used in lieu of of selling a house to um, basically pay someone's inheritance. Um, so there, there, there's different ways to do it. Uh, but generally speaking, the trustee will be in charge of figuring that out um, once once the time comes. Now, of course, when we when we design it, we try to avoid the situation that um, the couple does not want. Um, but but generally speaking, um, those decisions are, are are also like it's there's multiple decision points. One is at the time of of, of designing the document um, and drafting it, and the other is uh, upon upon passing because also the financial picture changes, right? Um, there may not be a house by the time uh, the, the 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 spouse has passed, um, and or there might be a lot more cash and so on and so forth. When you do the estate planning, you know, like when you pay you your the amount that you charge, um, is that only for per person or is that including the entire uh, both husband and wife? It's 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 joint. It includes it includes everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Hamid, for those questions. That was great. Um, we're we're approaching the one hour mark. Any final questions um for the from the group? I mean, I've got a laundry list of questions, Abud, but I think I'll save that for maybe a one-on-one -on -one <laughs> meeting. <laughs> Sounds good. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing this information. Um, this was absolutely fantastic, super informative. And again, to your first point, you know, have those conversations, sit down with your spouse, sit down with your family. These are important things to discuss. It is not something you know, that you can just put off, put off, put off or think, yeah, it's not a big deal. It'll, it'll work itself out. I think you've highlighted the importance of being a planner, right? And a lot, a lot, you know, we plan and a lot plans, but if they, those two things have to work together. So thank you for that reminder. Um, this has been, uh, this, we've recorded this session. We will upload it inshallah to our YouTube channel at Muslim space. You can find it there. We have a Boods, um, contact information. If anyone you know, needs it later on, feel free to reach out to uh, us or to, to, you know, to Muslim space, but we really thank you for this presentation, Abud, and um, thank you for joining us. This was, this was fantastic. Jazakallah. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Masalama. Salam.